Hello and welcome to the fourth of six presentations in the Nuancing National Security Lecture Series. My name is Matthew Hughes and I serve as the Executive Director of the International Relations Council in Kansas City, and we're so glad to have you with us today. The International Relations Council strengthens Kansas City's global perspective by maintaining an active dialogue around world events, global issues, and their impact on our community. As a nonpartisan educational nonprofit organization, the IRC values inform civil discourse, accessibility, and substance as we work to sharpen our community's 21st century global acumen. Whether you're joining us live or viewing the recording later, we invite you to learn more about the International Relations Council, including other upcoming events and how to join the IRC as a member on our website at irckc.org. Please take special note of the remaining programs in this series on cybersecurity and infrastructure resilience, as well as energy security in the coming weeks. A central mandate of any national government is national security, but the responsibility involves much more than traditional military defense capabilities. Today, while balancing military and diplomacy priorities, national governments assess and combat threats in cyberspace and outer space, water supplies and power grids, food production and energy chains. In this six part virtual series, the IRC is taking a deep dive into the national security arena, offering historical context and global perspective for core dimensions of national security and exploring the risks, priorities and tactics on the radar of US security policy. We hope you'll engage with us today as we explore transnational security issues. We certainly welcome your thoughtful questions through the course of the conversation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And do check out and share the other conversations in the Nuancing National Security series as we consider a range of critical issues in the coming weeks. We're grateful to our sponsors who have made today's program and the Nuancing National Security series possible. In particular, thanks to supporting series sponsors, Buttonwood Financial Group, Garmin, Nicole Gresham Perry, and Cyprian Simkowitz and Jerry White. Thank you for finding value in these conversations. I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator for today's program, who will introduce our speaker and help us navigate the conversation. Dr. Jack McLennan is an assistant professor of political science and graduate program director for national security studies at Park University, where he teaches international politics, comparative politics, and political theory. An international relations theorist, Dr. McLennan's work focuses on the role of technology in shaping security politics. His specific interests pertain to air power as a means of managing complex threat environments, the relationship between military force and humanitarianism, and the larger influence of technology on perceptions of threat and attempts to manage them. Originally from St. John, New Brunswick, Canada, he holds a BA with honors in political science from St. Thomas University, an MA in political science from the University of Windsor, a uh, master's of public policy from the University of Michigan Dearborn, and he completed his PhD at Carleton University in Ottawa in 2017, where his dissertation work focused on the history of air power as a means of humanitarian intervention in the post-Cold War period. Jack, it's a pleasure as always. Thank you for being such a friend of the International Relations Council. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, and it's my absolute pleasure this evening to moderate a conversation with, doc with Andrea Kendall Taylor, who's a senior fellow, fellow and director of the Transatlantic Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. She works on national security challenges facing the United States and Europe, focusing on Russia, authoritarianism, and threats to democracy, and the state of the Transatlantic Alliance. Prior to joining CNAS, Andrea served for eight years as the senior intelligence officer, from 2015 to 2018, she was Deputy National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. In this role, Andrea led the U.S. intelligence community's strategic analysis on Russia, representing the intelligence community in interagency policy meetings, provided analysis to the National Security Council, and briefed the Director of National Intelligence and other senior staff for White House and international meetings. Prior to joining the National Intelligence Council, Andrea was a senior analyst at the, Central, at the Central Intelligence Agency, where she worked on Russia and Eurasia, the political dynamics of autocracies, and democratic decline. Andrea is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, 
Her work has been published in numerous political science and policy journals, including the Journal of Peace Research, Democratization, the Journal of Democracy, Foreign Affairs, the Washington Post, the Washington Quarterly, and Foreign Policy. Andrew received her BA in politics from Princeton University and her PhD in political science from the University of California, Los Angeles, which is in a far warmer place than where I did my PhD. So that's a much that's better judgment on her part. She was a Fulbright scholar in Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, where she conducted dissertation research on oil and autocracy. Thank you very much, Andrea, for joining us. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Jack. So to get us started, um, I'd like to hear what is keeping you up at night these days and what you're sort of most urgently working and writing about. So I'm assuming you mean more than just my kids. Um, but uh, substantively, um, I think kind of a lot of the issues that you touched on in my bio kind of encapsulate the things that I'm thinking about and I'm most concerned about. And so number one at the top of my list of kind of biggest concerns is really the state of democracy, both home, at home and abroad. Um, my, you know, my focus is primarily on what we see happening internationally. Um, and in, in, you know, it's interesting to note how what we saw domestically in the last four years the way that kind of institutions were tested. We kind of learned um, some of the limits of US democracy where institutions are really just about the people who are in them. A lot of the kind of guardrails on our democracy are, are normative in many ways. And so over the last four years, a lot of pressing of the norms of our democracy. It's a pattern that is not unique at all to the United States. And it's what we're seeing in countries, um, including in the heart of you know, the origin of democracy in Europe. So in Hungary, in Poland, in Czech Republic, in Slovenia, we're seeing the degradation of democracy. Um, and then even beyond Europe, Turkey, uh, Brazil, Philippines. And it's this pattern of the slow, where you basically have democratically elected leaders who are coming to power and slowly dismantling democracy. Um, and it's so concerning because it's hard to push back on. Um, it's, it's something that happens incrementally such that citizens don't necessarily respond and react um, in a big way. And so it's that slow dismantling of democracy. And that's a real change in the way, um, historically, in the way that we've seen democracies break down in the past. Um, traditionally, you know, we used to see more coups in these quick, sudden, decisive breaks of democracy. So this is a real change. Um, and it's something that we at home, but also in the way that we do kind of support democracy and its resilience abroad need to adapt and change to. Um, the other thing, the other kind of key focus where I spend most of my time is thinking about Europe and Russia, as you mentioned. And so the other thing that keeps me up at night is the state of alliances, the state of our relationships uh, and our partnerships in Europe. I think we'll talk a little bit more about this, but obviously Afghanistan has underscored um, the kind of the tense nature of where our relationships with allies is at the current moment. So, um, you know, that's something thinking about what keeps me up at night. How do we restore? How do we strengthen? How do we revitalize alliances to meet the challenges that we have ahead of us? And then really the final thing that I, again, where I spend most of my time is on the Russia issue set. And I think there, my concern, and, and this kind of stems from where I think this administration is, they came in so focused on China. China has clearly been this administration's number one foreign policy priority, um, followed by th other transnational threats like climate and COVID. And in many ways, Russia has taken a backseat. And I worry sometimes about the kind of allocation of attention and resources where this administration is, I worry that they are giving disproportionate weight to the China issue set relative to some other challenges and wanting to make sure that we kind of right size the Russia challenge in our US foreign policy because it's pretty clear um, that this is gonna be a persistent problem um, for the foreseeable future. So kind of in a nutshell, I mean, those are the areas of obviously like where I have been most active in my research and in my past experiences, but I think those are top of my list. All right. I think I'd like to take a few of those and, and spin them out a little bit. So one of the things I'm sure a lot of us were paying attention to is the response of European allies and European leaders to the United States decision to withdraw from Afghanistan, not only the decision itself, but how it was carried out. Um, what does the withdrawal tell us about the transatlantic relationship currently and what we might need to think about moving into the future? 
Yeah, it's a good question because that I mean the the allies we I hear I talk a lot with European ambassadors on a regular basis here from foreign officials in Europe and and there is a lot of concern and allies are very upset like you said some about the decision itself but primarily about um, the way that the the withdrawal was handled and about the lack of what they perceived a lack of consultation um, in the lead up to that this decision and and the withdrawal. Um, but I do think it's important to note that, you know, the tension and some of the, the friction in our, your, our relationship with Europe didn't start now. It didn't start with President Trump. It really kind of has been a longstanding challenge um, in our foreign policy, really going back to the Obama administration when the United States was, you know, doing its pivot to Asia. And that really gave um, a lot of... Um, there was a lot of concern in Europe that the United States was moving away from its transatlantic focus and concern that the United States was no longer a reliable partner. And so it goes back then, obviously, with four years of Trump, that really further strained the transatlantic relationship. A lot of the rhetoric coming from the White House during that time was extremely critical of U.S. allies and partners, and you know, from everything from the, the tariffs um, considering our European allies kind of enemies on par with China. Um, uh, there was, you know, criticism per, in particular of Germany and Angela Merkel um, and some the, the kind of persistent questions about America and President Trump's commitment to Article 5. And so when uh, President Biden came back, there really was, or was elected, there was kind of a sigh of relief on the part of the Europeans um, many happy to see, you know, it, he is one of the most transatlantic oriented presidents we've had in a really long time. And so I think there was a lot of optimism about where our relationship with Europe would go under President Biden and his administration. Um, there was a lot of really positive early gestures. Um, President Biden did his first foreign trip to Europe. We had a series of summits with NATO and the European Union. Obviously, the rhetoric has changed remarkably, and this is a president who believes in the strength of alliances. So there was a lot of early positive signals. And I think with Afghanistan, though, a lot of that early goodwill um, has been undone. And so we're kind of we're back to this place where Europe wonders about how reliable the United States is as a partner. There's a lot of, um, it has really re-energized this conversation in Europe about building up their own capabilities um, because they believe they can no longer rely on the United States. So I think, you know, moving forward, um, the Afghanistan and the decision to withdraw and the way it played out was a blow. Like I said, I think it unwound a lot of the early um, improvements that President Biden has made. That said, the transatlantic relationship is quite resilient. We've been through a lot of periods of friction before. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm hopeful that we can work together as an alliance to kind of put things back on track. We have a lot of opportunity. There's a lot going on in the transatlantic relationship. We have this trade and technology council where we're talking about how we work with allies and partners to address technology issues, to make sure that we are competing effectively with China. We have a US-EU dialogue on China. How do we as a collective um, group of cohesive and like-minded partners take on China? Um, there's a whole, there's a lot going on. And I'm, so I'm hopeful that we will be able to move through what has been a difficult period. And I also hope that we can capture or leverage in a positive way these um, concerns about in Europe about their own capabilities. This is an opportunity for Europeans to actually do more to provide for their own security and defense. That is directly in the US interest. And so I'm hopeful that coming out of this, that there can be more dialogue um, and in coordination that Europeans will have the political will to invest more in their own security and defense because, and to strengthen that European pillar of NATO, because that, you know, in a world where the United States faces not just Russia, but also China and a number of threats, a more capable Europe at the end of the day is a positive. And so it's a, I guess my summary is it's, it's a tense period. It didn't start with Afghanistan. It goes back really quite a long way, but I am hopeful that we can leverage it in ways that are also positive so that we are um, collectively a stronger uh, set of allies. 
So I, you hit on two things that I think are really important. One is the nature of, of military force in the world today, in the Western world. Um, and it's important to know that most European countries spent the last 20 or 30 years relying on the United States' uh, larger military infrastructure to be able to project force anywhere. Um, so NATO has gotten very used to sort of riding around on the American coattails. Um, and that has influenced the decisions they make about uh, how they invest in their militaries, what postures those militaries take, and how Europe thinks about, um, say, the influence of Russia or other sort of national security issues in their area, like the migrant crisis and the ongoing instability in Northern Africa. Um, what do you think a, a more, so you, you talked a little bit about, you hope that this leads the Europeans to do more, right, to strengthen their role. What do you think that looks like from a US perspective? What, what does a stronger, what does a Europe, a stronger Europe as opposed to a, a more distant Europe look like? So I th so these are conversations that are being had at NATO. So the other thing to note too is, you know, when President Biden went to the NATO summit, they announced uh, this year that NATO would be embarking on a new strategic concept, which is basically kind of the guiding document of NATO. Um, and so there is an opportunity. I think so NATO is going through a, a lot of thinking about what it means to be an effective you know, collective defense alliance in the modern age. There's not just threats from Russia. The United States has also put China on the agenda and wanting NATO to kind of play a more central role in thinking about how we compete effectively with China. There's growing cyber threats. There's the counterterrorism threats. So there's, so NATO is kind of going through this process of reflection and, and coming up with a new guiding document that will kind of uh, set out and chart what, what a more kind of effective, capable NATO looks like. So those conversations about which capabilities need to be developed in Europe is something that will happen in that NATO context. Um, one thing that you know, the United States is thinking about that can help encourage that development in that direction is, so we obviously have this metric of 2%. And so back a long time at the Wales Summit, this was the, the, the kind of target that we set out that all NATO member states should spend 2% of defense, 2% of their GDP on defense. Um, allies, many allies haven't done that. And that was a lot of what President Trump was really concerned about viewing Europe as free riders because allies weren't meeting the commitments that they themselves made um, at that summit. There has been dramatic uh, positive improvement towards that metric. Some would say it's because President Trump was more uh, harsher in his rhetoric, but I think really the underlying issue there was the Russian military moves in Ukraine in 2014, right? So that was a huge wake up call, not just for the United States, but for Europeans, uh, highlighting the, the persistent threat, the persistent power that Russia still poses to the alliance. And so we've seen allies increasingly upping their defense budgets. Um, and But there is now a conversation about whether or not we need to rethink what counts towards that 2%. So should things like uh, cyber defenses, which currently don't count towards that, should things like roads and other infrastructure count towards that because that's a key part of NATO mobility? You know, one of the things where the United States and NATO is most concerned is, you know, being able to rapidly and quickly move forces across Europe should there be a conflict with Russia. So it's things like cyber, COVID, pandemics, like what, you know, there is a rethinking of what security looks like today. And there are ways to encourage spending in some of these new domains if we shift what that 2% looks like. So I know I didn't really very specifically um, answer your question, you know, we, whether it's airlift or, you know, what it is exactly that, that the capabilities that they need to discuss, but whatever it is, it needs to be discussed in tandem. Um, what the discussion is happening now is in, in the European Union. So it's the EU that is thinking a lot about, well, we need a rapid reaction force so that we don't have to rely on the United States if they don't want to go into certain areas, you know, if it's not in their core interest. Um, the, the challenge is to ensure that whatever, if the European Union actually decides to spend the resources to enhance that European pillar within NATO, there's a lot of discussion of, about ensuring that that's not redundant 
and duplicative and in any way undermining of what NATO is doing. So it's, I mean, probably like talking about the specific capabilities is, is probably a little bit beyond kind of what I know, but all, all of this context and the is happening um, and taking place. And the hope is that this Afghanistan bit and the Europeans willing that they can't really do anything without the United States, that that prompts them to increase the political will to spend on some of those core capabilities that need to be developed. No, I think that's a that's a really great answer. And it gets at the idea that the European Union is not gonna be able to contribute on par with the United States in many ways. Um, but one of the lessons that NATO learned going all the way back to the mid nineties, right, is this idea that they can contribute in very particular roles um, and can share and can take burden in ways that does help the alliance overall, right? And I, I think that you got at that really, really well. Um, I also think you were you were talking a little bit about expectations in Europe. Um, I'll also say expectations in Canada and Mexico, where that Biden was going to be a more um, open, sort of engaged partner in the United States. He made a big deal of saying, you know, America's back. They're going to uh, his new national security rhetoric talks a lot about re-earning a place of leadership in the global community. Um, and I think what a lot of people were hoping for was some sort of marquee moment where that materialized, right? Where the United States and its allies got some sort of win. Um, they drafted some new relationship, they wrote a new treaty, they, they engaged in some sort of form of international diplomacy that proved effective. Um, you talked a little bit about how the, the allies are pretty up in arms about the, the Afghan withdrawal and il illustrated a lot of the reasons why. But do you think there's a there's something like that in the close future where the United States and its allies will be able to point and say um, the relationship is still strong because we accomplished X? Or if there isn't one, um, what do you think would do that? Like that those of us thinking about what the United States should be thinking about specific issues might look to in, as, a, as a sort of test case for this? Gosh, that's a really good question. Um... You know, at the um, US-EU summit, which was part of Biden's first international trip, there was a new body stood up, the Trade and Technology Council. So that is kind of an example. I mean, it's not, you know, super sexy and it's not like a massive thing that we can point to that feels like a huge win. Um, but there, there, we are rebuilding, I think, the scaffolding for the coordination that needs to happen to ensure that the United States can compete effectively with China. This administration definitely recognizes that our allies are kind of power amplifiers. They make us stronger. They help us. Um, they they amplify our in influence internationally. And just how important it is that we are working together with like-minded allies, not just in the United States, but increasingly, but also in the Indo-Pacific. So there are small steps, things like the Trade and Technology Council, where we will work through a lot of these really important issues. Um, semi, and none of these are super, like I said, not super sexy, but like semiconductors. That's a huge issue in kind of uh, t competing with the, with Beijing. Um, so it's things like that um, that I think will gradually help build the scaffolding for these relationships. The other thing, well, and and this has been, I think, a source of a lot of uh, heartburn and um, sleepless nights probably within the White House, but there was the announcement straight from the beginning that the administration would host the Summit for Democracies. And I think in many ways that was intended to be, you know, the signature foreign policy thing early on for the Biden administration to be able to signal that very strong commitment to democracy, to say that U.S. leadership on democracy and human rights is back, to say that we put democracy kind of front and center of our U.S. foreign policy. Obviously, Afghanistan makes that hard, right? I like, And so um, I think they'll be working through that summit of democracies to try to have a moment where they are able to bring together a lot of the world's like-minded allies and partners. They will err on the side of inclusivity to have some of these dialogues and discussions. Um, so I, I don't know that it's any one thing. Um, the other, you know, and, and, and then in the NATO context, just since we're kind of more focused on the Europe piece, um, there was an announcement at the next year's NATO summit that there would be um, Indo-Pacific allies and partners. 
So there's this effort, like I was saying, to bring together like-minded nations, whether it's on technology issues, the sharing of best practices. There's there's a lot of that that's happening. It's 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 clear that there it's going to be hard to have that one moment, but I think they're hard at work in trying to revitalize those relationships and to demonstrate U.S. leadership um, where we'll where we're able to do that. And I and and also, but with humility too. I mean, I think. I don't know how many, you know, if Europeans or others would agree, but I think that this administration has been very humble about the our own shortcomings, the challenges that we went through with the capital insurrection. Um, clearly, Afghanistan is, is is a humbling moment for the way the United States can project power and its capability to to influence outcomes. So I do think that there is some humility and also, and you know, Secretary Blinken in some of his early foreign policy speeches talked a lot about, like, we don't sweep that under the rug. We do it out in the open. These are shared challenges that many of our allies and partners have, and we want to work through them together. So there, I think there's a lot happening, but I, I don't see like a, a, a big kind of focal point necessarily. I think that's really important also to, to think about because there's a propensity in sort of media discussion or larger political discussion to try to, to measure relationships between allies like it's the weather, like you get a register of it and it's either it's good or it's bad, it's hot or it's cold. Um, and it's important to note all of the things that you just said speak to the fact that especially with the transatlantic sort of relationship, they are very process based, right? Like they're ongoing discussions there's multiple points of contact, there's lots of issues being worked at the same time, and that creates a lot of opportunity uh, for ongoing engagement. It also necessitates ongoing engagement. So it's interesting to think about trying to plot the, the larger trend um, than just sort of diagnose it in one um, place or another. Um, I think I, I'd like to shift a little bit um, and talk a little bit about Europe itself. Um, and you talked a, a little bit about how we've had our own issues at home around the January 6th insurrection, the ongoing discussion of the legitimacy of the last election. But Europe itself is, is struggling with these similar problems. Um, and given the rise of something like reactionary populism in Central and Eastern Europe, places like Hungary and Poland, what does the future of the EU as a security partner look like? So maybe the other half of, of that last comment that you made about our ability to sort of project power in, in, in a unified way. What is the, what is the European um, context look like in a similar way? Yeah, so I mean, so definitely right to point out like that these are shared challenges and it kind of goes back to the first point I was talking about with kind of the challenges that democracies face, these democratically elected leaders who are coming to power and undermining um, democracy within. Hungary is a really important example of that. It's a, obviously a member of the European Union, a member of NATO. And so it raises questions about when you have these illiberal voices within these institutions, what it means for the cohesion of those institutions. And right, the cohesion is key because in institutions like NATO, they are consensus-based organizations. And so when you have the, the big question is whether or not kind of if they become more illiberal leaning, whether or not that undermines the cohesion of the institution itself. And certainly those are some of the fissures that out external actors and in particular Russia are trying to, to poke and prod and, and pull at. Um, so that's a, a key issue to, to keep in mind. So it's really about the cohesion, but I would say you know, but first and foremost, these security institutions are military based. So they are security institutions. And while, you know, the democratic foundations of them are really important at the end of the day, like NATO, for example, is a military alliance. So it has a lot to do. It just comes back to that earlier question about the will and the, the really the political will of Europeans to spend on their security and defense. And so I think, again, just I think that, you know, with Afghanistan, there really is an opportunity to work with allies to get them and to encourage their spending more on security and defense so that we can together, you know, ensure that we are maintaining um, the deterrence that we need, not just for Russia, but increasingly for China, who is, in, you know, it, it, China for Europe is really far away. Um, but at the same time, they're getting closer. They're more active in the Arctic. They're more present in the Mediterranean. They have a base in Djibouti. Um, there are cyber attacks. All of these things are also bringing China closer to NATO's borders. 
And so it's now on their radar for the first time. So I think, you know, it obviously addressing and working through these challenges to democracy is important that we maintain um, an, an alliance of like-minded partners. Um, but oftentimes that, right, that's happening in parallel with some of the security discussions and the hard choices about where to spend um, GDP and other revenue to ensure that NATO maintains the deterrence. So I, I've got a few questions starting to come in from the chat, which is great. And I just take a moment to remind everybody that, yeah, you can wander down to the bottom and, and type in your questions and I'll take them in queue and um, ask Dr. Kendall Taylor. Um, I have one question here from somebody who's interested in um, Russian annexation of parts of Georgia, which leads into one of the questions I was going to ask about, which is this context that you've done a really good job of, of, of fleshing out for us over the last few minutes does matter to some very particular kinds of problems. And one of the ones we can look at might be Russia, right? Uh, Russia's spoiling behavior um, on the continent, right? Um, it's annexation of parts of Georgia, parts of Ukraine. Um, it's sort of shoulder brustling around Finland and the Baltic states and Poland. Um, and then also it's, it's well-documented attempts um, to sort of pursue political goals via Dis and, dis and misinformation campaigns in the sort of cyber realm. So what does this transatlantic context mean for Western responses to sort of Russia's behavior? So I think, yeah, first and foremost, it's important. Um, I, I guess this goes back to my earlier point about like the importance of making sure that the United States and Washington, you know, that Washington doesn't take its eye off the Russia challenge. So coming in, this administration, as I was saying before, has been kind of laser focused on China. You look in some of their interim national security guidance in its engagement with allies. Um, China really has been the, the big priority. Um, you know, if you remember back in April, Russia amassed troops yet again in and around Ukraine's border. And I think that served um, as a really important reminder for this administration that is as much as they would like to move Russia aside and deal with more important things like China, that Russia remains a disruptor. Um, Putin will continue to look for ways to compel the United States to deal with Russia. That's what he wants. He wants US attention. He wants to be seen as on par with the United States. And so you know, that, that is, is, a, is an important challenge moving forward. Um, in terms of the transatlantic relationship, it's important then that Russia remains the primary focus of our policy. It remains the focus in NATO's strategic concept coming up. And we have to continue, like we are saying, continuing to encourage allies and partners to do more to spend um, for their own security and defense because that is the deterrence that we need in Russia. If, you know, from Washington's perspective, we are increasingly concerned about China. China is increasing its military capabilities they are set to be on par with the United States in a number of important metrics in the coming years. And so that sets the United States up potentially for a two front conflict, because I think what the biggest concern from Washington would be is if one country, Russia or China, looks to take advantage of a conflict that the other might be having with Washington to advance their own aims. And so in that world, we really we don't want the deterrence in, in Europe to be the weak link in our strategy. We need to maintain that credible deterrent to ensure that Russia isn't looking to, 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 to move and to, and to take NATO on in any direct way, um, that he continues to see NATO as a superior force. Um, and, and, so, and so that's key. Um, and so it really, in the transatlantic discussion, it's about ensuring we maintain the deterrent but I think it's also important that we don't only see Russia through a military lens, because as you talked about, so much of what they're doing is below that threshold of conflict. It's the disinformation, it's the targeting of elections. It's happening right now in Germany, right? Germany has their election, I think next week. And there is all sorts of misinformation, disinformation, targeting the, the potential candidate of the Green Party, Annalena Baerbach. Um, who had, you know, by the way, has taken a much more kind of principled and a much harder line on deterring uh, Germany's adversaries, Russia and China. So it's happening, it, it continues to happen. The cyber attacks, we had the solar winds breach, we had the colonial pipeline attack. All of these ransomware attacks, 
Europe has them too. So we share these challenges also below this threshold of war. Corruption is a huge issue, um, it, not only in the United States, but it's something that the Kremlin weaponizes to increase its influence beyond its borders. So these are all shared challenges that we in Europe have um, and that we can take it more steps to coordinate and align policies to deter, not just at a conventional military level, but also a lot of these um, kind of sub Article 5 threats like cyber and disinformation and attacks on elections. Um, and I had a, a interesting question in the chat about, so you talked about the military side of this, you talked about the, the cyber side of this. Is there a uh, socioeconomic side of it? Is, is there um, a sort of social or economic set of a re re arrangements or, or goals that we should be thinking about pursuing with the Europeans and, or even in, if you want to sort of take it a little broader, you keep referencing China. Um, are there socioeconomic parts of this that uh, much to Matthew's prefacing comments may not be the first kind of thing that comes to mind to the, the sort of general audience when they think about countering Russia um, that we need to think about or maybe address? Yes, um, there are a lot of important and other tools. So one of the things that kind of falls a little more in that basket is in the technological realm. Um, and so one of the things I've been doing a lot of research and writing on is how authoritarian regimes are using technology to suppress, repress their populations, how they've basically figured out how to take technology that used, you know, we had all of that optimism about technology, you know, connecting people and, and making it easier for citizens to challenge or to challenge repressive regimes. Well, China certainly um, is doing all sorts of kind of dystopic things in terms of surveillance and creating these social credit scores. Um, Russia often gets overlooked, but it is also establishing its own brand of digital dictatorship and it's using technology to repress at home. But really importantly, there is more and more collaboration between those two actors in international institutions. So in the UN, for example, the International Telecommun Telecommunications Union, that's where international, uh, all, all the different countries are getting together to discuss like rules and norms. How do we maintain a free and open internet? What are the appropriate rules and norms around cyber? Um, Russia and China are pushing really hard to push their own authoritarian, illiberal worldview. Um, they both are aligned in their view that the internet um, is a threat to their hold on power. They view democracy as undermining their hold on power at home. So there's a so in some of these different realms, it's definitely not just military, but in international organizations, for example, there's a lot that the United States and Europe and other like-minded allies and partners need to do to push back on Russia and China's efforts to rewrite the rules and the norms that kind of govern the appropriate use of technology. Um, so I think that that's a really good example of some of these other venues, these other kind of critical battle spaces, really, um, where the competition with not just Russia, but also China is taking place. So you, a few times you've referenced Russia and China together, and I know over the last year you've written quite a bit about the increasing cooperation between Russia and China. Um, and the increasing alignment in their foreign policies. What do you think is driving this increasing cooperation? Yeah, it's a really good point. So I think, you know, I talked about the things that keep me up at night. I didn't mention this one, but this one is definitely in my top five. Um, so, it, you know, obviously the United States has two difficult relationships, two primary adversaries, China, and then a more distant second, according you know, to the prioritization of this administration, Russia. The really alarming thing is that the relationship between those two is deepening in really significant ways. So especially since 2014, and I think some of this was present before then, but that was a key accelerant. That's when Russia illegally annexed Crimea and really was cut off you know, from the Western world with sanctions and other things. And at that point, Putin and the Russian elite, there's a calculation that they don't really have a future in the West. And they uh, really accelerated their efforts to reach out to, chi to China. They're now using that relationship to bypass a lot of the pressure that the United States is looking to put on Russia. So to bypass sanctions. 
sanctions, US sanctions, Western sanctions cut off things, technology, military parts that Russia used to access in the West, but because of sanctions no longer can. Well, now they get them from China in many cases or trade. Um, China is now Russia's number one trading partner, surpassed Germany. They're push, shipping more oil and gas to, to Russia or to China. Um, their cooperation is deepening in the military domain. For China, that's really significant because what they're doing is getting a lot of extremely sophisticated weapons systems from Russia, like air defense systems, the S-400, anti-submarine capabilities, anti-ship capabilities. They're able to get those from Russia and it's basically enabling the PLA then to do a better job at, at keeping the United States out of its backyard where it doesn't want us around Taiwan and other places. So there's a lot, I mean, when, whether it's in the diplomatic, I talked about the international institution. So it's diplomatic relations, trade relations, in the technology domain, more partnerships and exchanges, and really critically um, in the defense domain and on those democracy and human rights. So all across the board, that relationship is, is deepening. And it matters for the United States because what we argue is it amplifies the challenge that both countries pose um, they, be, in large part because they're working together to bypass um, Western pressure. And I think in terms of what's driving it, obviously for Russia, it was because they view less of a future in the West and China becomes a more meaningful partner. But as I said before, there is, I mean, there is alignment of worldview. Both of these leaders see democracy and human rights as this thinly veiled attempt for the United States to be able to spread its influence. And they see the global order and the rules as advantaging the United States and disadvantaging them. So they are aligned in their efforts to push back against democracy and to try to rewrite some of the global order in ways that are more advantageous to them. So it's a meaningful partnership. And I think um, I would say in the next 10 years is one of the issues that will be most consequential for the United States when our two adversaries are increasingly aligned. Um, it, I think that's that's it's going to create a lot of challenges that we're going to have to think through. Yeah, and I, I think it's really important to note some of the things you talked about about how Russia and China have a different sort of illiberal view of how they'd like the international um, in, infrastructure to function. Um, I think China is really interesting because it. it basically wants an illiberal version of the liberal world order. It, it wants multilateralism where it suits it. It wants open markets where it can benefit from them. Um, it wants to manage trade at a global level so that it can maintain market share, but it doesn't want to talk about democracy and it doesn't want to talk about these other elements. Um, I do have a question in the chat that relates to this and, and basically asking what does an alternative to this order look like um, with the caveat that some of the mechanisms that we used to go back to in the 90s um, look increasingly frayed. Um, so things like the United Nations has, has become less and less legitimate. Um, international organizations are grappling with sort of problems of providing some of the things that they they were at least designed to help bring into existence over the last few years. And that's raised a lot of questions about the sort of viability of our current international architecture. So what does a US-led response to this look like in your mind? Well, I, I mean, I, so it's hard to say, you know, I think that the, the alternative order is one that Russia and China is pushing, which is governed by, you know, not by liberal democracy and not by those, those rules and norms and those standards. Um, what they are pushing for at least, so I don't know China as well, but from the Russian perspective, what they have been pushing for, um, you know, for forever and ever is really a multipolar wo world order. So they believe um, that, that the world should have these, they'll call it polycentric. So multiple kind of centers of power um, where Russia is on par with the United States and has an equal say and will be consulted on any um, issue where Russia has a stake. Um, I think in their mind, we are, and I would probably agree with some of this, we're well past this unipolar moment where the United States was the sole, sole kind of hegemon, the, the main power. Um, they see that that has moved a long time ago and they are have grown frustrated with United States or Washington's willingness to kind of accept that. Um, and so that's a lot of the kind of tension and friction is I would say, you know, United States wanting to maintain its leadership role and its hegemony, 
but you've got these alternate competing centers of power who are saying, you know, your time has passed and that international institutions need to do a better job at reflecting the actual balance of power globally. Countries like China, Russia, India, Brazil, those are the countries that need to have a greater say in global affairs. Um, but from, so, you know, I'm definitely not an IR person, but I think, you know, from Russia's perspective, it is, it has a lot to do. They view this current system as disadvantageous to them, that it benefits the United States and its allies. And they want to rewrite some of those rules and norms. You know, one of their primary principles is sovereignty. So that's what they push, that the United States doesn't have a right to come in and have a say over the domestic affairs of any country. Um, they use that as a way to push back, you know, they're, they're going around pushing this idea of sovereignty as a way to say that the United States has no right to tell countries how to run their own internal business. Oh, and by the way, like the, you know, authoritarianism and, and repression and all of those things are fine because it's, you know, it's, it's not the international community's business how to run that. So, you know, it's hard to kind of sketch out what an alternate order looks like, but both of those countries certainly see that they deserve a greater say over kind of key decisions that they have more sway over their spheres of influence is what they would call them um, and want the United States kind of out of those things and not meddling in the domestic affairs of other countries. I think that's a great summary, right? It, it, it gets at this idea that the order, um, even if the United States is preponderant in a lot of ways, is no longer a hegemony. So if, I think there's some, some of my students in the chat, and they're probably pounding the table because I've been making the read about it for weeks now. Um, but that's shifted. And, and that's, but mm -hmm. I think what's interesting is states are, some states like Russia and China want more authority because they want to push an alternative agenda. Um, I think other states want more say because they're, they're, they see it as more legitimate now. So that's the Brazil's and in the bricks of the world where they're starting to say, look, we, we're on board here, but we would like to have more say um, in how some of these decisions get made because quite frankly, we're more important than we were 20 years ago. Um, and I think going back to what you said earlier about the United States taking a leadership role and using our resources is one thing, but knowing the limitations of that um, in a changing world is really key. Um, now, I, I want to shift just slightly a little bit um, in the last few minutes we have, because um, in March, you published an essay entitled All Politics is Personal in Foreign Affairs. And I, I think that this is an important piece of what we've been talking about for the last few minutes about how states are going to rearrange their relationships um, as U.S. hegemony starts to wane slightly and the international system starts to look different. And there's an alternative out there for the first time in uh, 20 some odd, 30 years. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, that essay and how it might relate to some of the themes we've touched on? Yeah, so I think this just gets at the kind of challenges that democracies face. And um, so historic, like most of my research past work has focused primarily on authoritarian regimes. Um, and in some of the research that I've done um, with others, um, we have found that this, there's different types of authoritarianism um, but there's one type is a personalist dictatorship where power is predominantly in the hands of an individual versus a party like the Chinese Communist Party or the PRI in Mexico, or not a military regime where you have a junta like in Thailand um, or other places. So there's different types of authoritarianism. But what we've seen is that there's been this significant rise in personalist dictatorships, and there's really great political science research that shows well, those are kind of the most problematic of any other regime. They're more likely to fight wars, invest in their nuclear arsenals. They're the most corrupt. They're the least likely to democratize. They, they really have created all sorts of problems historically. And so we had been really interested in this idea of personalism in dictatorships, but then increasingly we're seeing similar trends in democracies. So thinking about personalism in a democracy is slightly different, but the idea is generally the same where a leader would have a disproportionate amount of influence and say relative to their political party. It's like more power concentrated in the individual versus the party. And so again, with these same scholars, we collected a lot of data and created an index of personalism. And it turns out that personalism in democracies is also on the rise. And the thing that is most consequential about it is that it is, is really actually very bad for democracy. It's a con statistical models and other things when you control for a whole host of factors. 
the more personalist a regime gets, the more likely democracy is to collapse. Um, it's, the, it's the gateway to that slow degradation of democracy that we've been talking about. And so you can, I mean, this really, again, is the pattern. Think about, I mean, Putin started that way, but Chavez in Venezuela was started as a democracy, personalized, de decayed, democracy decayed. Erdogan in Turkey, a democratically elected leader, concentrated power, democracy de 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 uh, deteriorated. So it's really the story about, and, and, and it's a really open question, I think, about why it's happening. Um, and so that's one area where we're looking to go with future research. I think a lot of it likely has to do with technology. There's, there's some sort of nexus there between the way that leaders are able to use technology and the way it facilitates their ability to consolidate more power. Um, and we do, we had some initial findings that talked about, you know, those leaders who rely more on digital repression um, tend to see, tend to become more personalist over time. So there, there's, you know, clearly something is happening with this, with technology and it's clearly, you know, reshaping democratic politics too. Um, and one of the outcomes that we highlight is this personalization and the, the, the growing importance of individuals rather than political parties. Um, so in response to that, there's an interesting question in the, in the chat that sort of asks to distill that a little bit, which is there's lots of problems the US is facing um, in terms of Russia and China and also this personalization of leadership, not only in autocracies, but also in democracies. Um, do you think there's one or two things that the United States should be doing as a result of this that it's not, um, that, that there, there are different approaches we could take or different frames we could use or different initiatives that we could pursue that would help us better either position ourselves to be influential on these questions or to address them directly, like to, to help bolster democracy in other states directly? So that's, I think, the million dollar question. And I think there's a lot of thought and contemplation being given to how the United States should um, respond. I mean, that's, because it, it's really important to note that these are really different challenges like that, that I highlighted before when democracies break down at the hands of democratically elected leaders, that's a total change from the way that it used to be before, um, where it was coups and other things. And so the dynamics and therefore the support for democracy and the way that you increase resilience of democracy looks totally different. Um, likewise with technology, um, you know, one of the key changes we've seen with the, with the rise of the internet, social media, other things is um, more authoritarian leaders now are being ousted in protest than ever before. Um, that's a change. It used to be, there are other methods and um, it's, she basically changed this kind of survival tactics that then authoritarians use to hold their power, right? So if you used to believe that you were most vulnerable to coups and elite insiders, and now you see your people as more problematic, that is what in many ways has led them to kind of try to co-opt co these technologies to flip the script and to actually use it to enhance repression. There's a lot we don't know. Um, and so I think what is happening now is that there is a lot more kind of hard thought at agencies like USAID and in the, Demo the State Department, the Democracy and Human Rights Bureau, that these new challenges re re demand that we rethink the way that we do democracy support. Um, I think the Biden administration has taken some early good steps. So like one, I think is actually the focus on our, demo our democracy at home. Um, there has been so much talk with the Biden administration about how important it is that we get our own house in order. So cleaning up corruption, some of these loopholes um, in uh, real estate laws and beneficial ownership. These are all things. That, and I guess the other really interesting thing that captivates me is how the lines between foreign policy and domestic politics are increasingly blurred. Right. So if we are a weaker democracy at home, we do a less good job in supporting the resilience of democracies externally. When our democracy is weak at home, it makes it easier. It creates these weak links that external adversaries like Russia and China can exploit. So there's this really fascinating now kind of blurring of the lines between domestic and foreign policy in some really interesting ways. But so what should we be doing? I think the focus on cleaning up democracy at home is really critical. 
um, showing up in international organizations. So under the Trump administration, the United States left you know, the World Health Organization. We left the UN Human Rights Council. Biden has put us back. We need to show up in international organizations and we need to be doing that leadership. Um, I think you know, there's the, the personalization argues about how important political parties are, that you actually need to strengthen the constraints around a leader um, in order to kind of push back on their efforts to consolidate executive control. So I don't have any, a complete answer to that question, but doing it at home, showing up in international organizations, keeping a light on it, like the Democracy Summit for Democracies, I don't know how that will go, but signaling that this is an issue that we take seriously, being humble and recognizing that we have our own problems at home and we're working through them and we're doing it with allies and partners who share these things, those are all good first steps. Um, it, but in, in the, in, it's also, so there's like the democracy issue for the democracy issues, but there's all like the technology basket is really critically important also. So with the digital dictatorship, right? The Chinese Communist Party is using surveillance and other digital tools to carry out mass repression against their Uyghur population. So it's strengthening some of our legislation. We need more export controls to make sure that US homegrown technologies aren't being used to abuse human rights in other countries. Um, we need more sanctions on individuals who are perpetrating those democracy and human rights abuses. So we have a global Magnitsky Act. The U and guess what? Now the European Union has an equivalent and the UK has created their own equivalent. That's all pretty new. So coordinating the export controls, increasing sanctions in a multilateral format, and through things that we're doing like this Trade and Technology Council, making sure that we as democracies are on the cutting edge in developing these technologies so that we set the norms and the standards about how technology is used. So it's just when you kind of think it's a huge issue and it has so many different facets. Um, so it, it has to be like a I hate the jargony, like whole of government approach, but it really affects so many different pieces of the government and requires such a comprehensive um, approach. All right, well, thank you very much for all of that. I, I enjoyed all of it immensely. Um, and for the, my students who are not in the gallery, I'm gonna throw the video recording at them and make them watch it later. Um, so with that, I'm gonna say thank you for me and I'm gonna hand it back over to Matthew for the final word. Andrea and Jack, thank you so much uh, for what was just a marvelous conversation. I think a, a really important perspective in this series on what national security means and how we look at it. And Andrea, your point on, on alliances and maintaining those alliances, I think is central, uh, not just from the US perspective, but from so many points of view around the world. So thank you for your detailed insight tonight. Jack, thank you for your fine moderation and everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, this evening for another interesting installment in the Nuancing National Security series. Uh, we invite you to check out the calendar of upcoming events at the International Relations Council on our website at irckc.org. Thanks so much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.